Greetings, everyone. I'm going to uh, reorganize who's appearing here just for a second. Uh, so as I'm sure everybody is tired of hearing now, <laughs> I'm Nate Angel from Hypothesis, and I want to welcome you to this uh, very special edition of what we're calling Featured Educator Office Hours, um, where we invite some folks from around the community who have some experience with social annotation to just come have a kind of casual chat and conversation with whoever shows up about social annotation and how they might use it in their practice, maybe questions of pedagogy, um, what, is it, what does it look like in the real world, or other topics as well. We can really talk about anything we want here. And so uh, without further ado, I want to um, uh, give our, uh, our featured educators here a chance to introduce themselves. And I'm going to ask each one of you a kind of specific question to kick things off. And this is really the only kind of structured part of the conversation. And the rest of it from here will be completely driven by the conversation. Um, and that, that first question, and I'll go to Dana first, if you don't mind, Dana. Um, that first question is, if you could tell us a little bit about what your role is, um, you know, what you do in your day to day, and then how you came across social annotation and, and how it relates to your practice. And then we'll follow up with that same question to the other folks and after Dana has a chance to, to go. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Dana Conard. I work with a unit called Online Education at uh, UC Santa Cruz here in California. So it's still morning for me. Um, my role is instructional technology support specialist. So uh, I specifically help instructors um, put in instructional technology like hypo hypothesis into their course. Our LMS is Canvas. Um, we also have a video hosting platform. Um, so my day to day is helping instructors uh, deliver their well designed instructional content to their uh, students. And uh, I first learned about Hypothesis from the, the instructors. We had a lot of requests from instructors who had heard about Hypothesis and wanted to use it in their course. So, so then our journey was to, to implement it in our instance of Canvas and to onboard instructors. And we've been using it officially since fall 2020. That was our pilot. Um, so we've only been using it for a few quarters so far, but the, the reaction has been very positive, both from instructors and from students. So. Awesome. That's that's great. Um, and I think one thing that, that is clear here is that we do have a kind of special focus today on um, some of the folks who are a little bit more behind the scenes with enabling social annotation at their institutions, as opposed to what you might call, you know, front and center at the beginning of the classroom. So, um, Kyle, kind of the same question to you. Um, what do you do with your days? And <laughs> I should ask, what are you reading as um as Ramey and Ontario just asked in there. Um, maybe we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, And then how did you come across social annotation and, and how does it fit into your practice? Yeah, so my name is Kyle Denlinger. I'm the digital pedagogy and open education librarian at Wake Forest in North Carolina. Um, and in my role, I'm on a team in the library uh, called Digital Initiatives and Scholarly Communication. So we deal a lot with uh, digital humanities, humanities projects and uh, anything that really touches on um, copyright and access uh, related to scholarship um, and with the addition of me on our team to um, more digital pedagogy things um, such as OER and that kind of stuff. And um, I also teach fully online and I've been teaching a fully online information literacy course since 2015. Um, and in my own just kind of looking around being very much online, I found Hypothesis uh, probably through some online discussions and wound up using it in my own fully online course um, before we had an integration into Canvas. Um, my role has kind of shifted a little bit since I moved on to this new team. I still teach online, but now I am much more faculty outreach oriented and um, supporting faculty development of online uh, courses and specific digital pedagogy projects. Um, so the big thing that happened with me at Wake Forest was that, of course, with the transition to COVID, um, I really wanted to integrate Hypothesis into Canvas um, and get get Hypothesis in front of as many people as I could before we went live uh, in fall 2020. Um, and so I could speak a little bit to our kind of um, faculty support model uh, that happened in the summer of 2020, which I think was really successful at getting um, Hypothesis to be well known on campus and to be e extremely widely used in fall of 2020. So. Really, really cool. And I'm, uh, I want to give 
uh, Shauna a, ch a chance to jump in too, but we know that she might be having a, a little bit of trouble connecting. Uh, I uh, I love hearing um, the very different perspectives that you guys um, kind of have already brought to the table. Um, and uh, I'll just, um, you're, would you, um, would you say what I'm already thinking about is sort of the institutional context in which you're working. And so I think, um, I don't, I don't know, I don't know Wake Forest that well, I'm going to admit. Um, I have spent a little time at the, what may be the most beautiful campus on earth at UC Santa Cruz, <laughs> um, go banana slugs. And um, <clears throat> it's what a fantastic location that is. I just don't, it seems like unfair that anybody even gets to go to school there really. Um, but I'm, I'm curious and, maybe we could start actually with Kyle this time. Is there, do you think there's something, I know that social annotation has kind of taken off at Wake Forest in a pretty big way. Is there something do you think that's specific about the culture or context at Wake Forest that has made that possible? That's a good question. And it's kind of, um, I would say when we piloted Hypothesis in fall 2020, it was kind of a perfect storm uh, of things. And I think a lot of it had to do, well, I think it's partially due to like our heavy emphasis on small courses, or small classes. Uh, Wake Forest is a private university, so we have very small class sizes um, and it's quite a luxury, right? Um, and it's very liberal arts oriented. And so there's a lot of reading and writing, even in the more science disciplines. Um, and I think there's also um, a really healthy culture of, teachers doing really experimental, innovative things um, and feeling protected in doing so. So um, I think when people were exposed to hypothesis in the summer of 2020 um, in this faculty development program that we ran, um, they saw a lot of applications for it um, in many different disciplines and uh, they just kind of ran with it. Um, yeah, so it, it, I think it has a lot to do with the teaching culture, but I think um, more than anything, it had to do with the way we did faculty support in the summer. That makes sense. And I, I mean, what you say about there being a perfect storm is is sort of true just with the pandemic as a whole. I mean, at Hypothesis, we've just seen uh, social annotation usage skyrocket. And that's a kind of disturbing silver lining inside the pandemic. Um, <laughs> but if that's what it takes to jumpstart something like this, I don't, it's not like I, uh, I'm happy that the pandemic happened, but if there is some good to take away from it, one little piece of good, maybe that's it. So maybe then over, to, over to you then, Dana, do you think, I know that Santa Cruz, there's also been quite a bit of rapid adoption. I would say, I don't know if it looks that way from your perspective, but from what I've been seeing is, do you think there's something special about the culture there at Santa Cruz that makes that possible? I, I would say absolutely. Um, one of the leading departments that wanted to get hypothesis was our writing department, and they have um, smaller classes and they wanted their students to engage more. I think a lot of the driving factor of hypothesis, as, as fantastic as the platform is, has been the social aspect of these annotations. Um, because students, you know, there, there's only so much um, Zoom boxes you could take. I think hypothesis came at a perfect time because uh, it was a way for students to interact with each other in a way that wasn't just those zoom boxes um, and it the popularity of hypothesis really was propagated by the instructors and they they have had wide support for it they really enjoyed the tool and i will say our onboarding was fantastic um, we did adopt it pretty quickly in my experience for a digital tool but I, I will shout out Erin um, from Hypothesis. She was fantastic with um, helping us through that transition. We had maybe three workshops in the beginning of, uh, but right before fall, where she held our hand, she walked us through it, she answered faculty questions. Um, it was exceptional. So Hypothesis really helped us with that transition as well. And now that we've been using it for three quarters, uh, we're seeing a lot of adoption. Well, I'm so glad that you were able to to come on. We can see and hear you perfectly. Um, and I'm wondering, I want to give you a chance to to kind of kick things off the way that Kyle and Dana did by um, uh, giving us an introduction to, you know, what do you do in your days, <laughs> just so we can understand your context a little bit. And then how did you come across social annotation yeah. and, and how does it enter into your practice? Yeah, my apologies for the technical troubles, but 
it's happening. No worries. So, um, and I think I share um, real similar to what I heard both Kyle and Dana talking about. Um, I'm an academic technologist. I work in the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus. Um, I support faculty like Dana. I do Canvas. Um, and we do a lot of uh, my my personal area of passion is working with geographic information systems but i have to say annotation is very quickly making a is climbing the ladder in terms of um the technology that i feel has the most impact with students um so what we the way we got involved was a former colleague of mine had worked quite a bit with jeremy i believe and when the pandemic hit we, we were already exploring getting the uh, integration with Canvas. And when the pandemic hit, um, the college was said, we need something, we need another tool, something else to um, give instructors another way to interact with students. So for me, the pandemic in this case was good because it let us, we tried to did a pilot first of all, and then we did do a contract last semester just within the College of Liberal Arts. And we kept it pretty limited for the first, um, the first year of this use. We are going, um, full contract for my college next year. So I'm very excited about that. That's great. And you know, I, another thing came up that I think might be really interesting to hear from you about too. And that's, I mean, you're at another institution also near and dear to my heart um, because obviously who doesn't love the Twin Cities, but um, <laughs> I mean, the weather, the weather sometimes leaves something to be desired, but um, what, a, what an awesome place. And I nearly went to grad school there. I was this close. Um, but at any rate, um, I'm wondering, would you say that there's something special about the culture at at your school that um, that made it, or particularly right for the adoption of social annotation? I think that's a really, really interesting question. Um, I think there was something special about the College of Liberal Arts as opposed to some of the other colleges. Um, CLA was the only one that agreed to do the pilot. Um, a lot of others were very, had other con had more concerns, and I think we were like, let's try it and see what happens. Um, and the faculty who jumped on, I didn't do any advertising of this; it just kind of went by word of mouth. The faculty who jumped on board were also just, it was it's something very new to them, and they were willing to just take a take a chance and try it. Um, and maybe that's liberal arts. I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, I will say we had really. Um, we did some student evaluation and faculty evaluations, and I'd love to talk about that at some point about the reactions and the responses that we've gotten. Sorry, right, typing in the chat and, and um, talking at the same time is not something I've mastered, <laughs> um, as you can see from the typo. Uh, and um, I'm actually curious, um, I might bounce a little bit off this, this chat conversation um, started uh, started around other tools, other social annotation tools, because first of all, this I annotate conference isn't really just about hypothesis. I know it may seem like it is sometimes, but it's really, it's supposed to be organized around the idea of open annotation. And we define that fairly broadly in thinking about, um, especially tools that um, have openness in other ways, like they may have open technologies with APIs, they may be open source tools. Um, just being free on the web doesn't necessarily count as open in everybody's book <laughs> um, because of course being free on the web has other uh, things writing on it. Um, but I'm kind of curious and we, we talked about hypothesis at your institutions, but I'm wondering, do you guys know of other uh, social annotation tools that are in use in your campus and you have any experience with those? I don't, I don't know who would answer first. So I'll go to the Brady Bunch view. Go for it. Kyle. <laughs> Uh, well, I have I have a couple of examples, maybe. Um, so, uh, and maybe I'll go a little bit deeper into the summer support model that um, I talked about earlier. So, um, it's going to be hard to explain, but we have about 900 faculty uh, in our undergraduate college at Wake, and oh, well, sorry, undergraduate and our graduate school, excluding our professional schools and our med school, um, and our summer support model kind of put everyone into like a peer learning community. So we had eight faculty members, um, or, sorry, eight development people of which I was one. Uh, each of us created a peer learning community for, um, I think there was a group of 64 faculty that went through our program in the summer. And then those 64 faculty turned around and created peer learning communities for their own. And the key piece of it was that we um, 
demonstrated social annotation in the, that initial initial cohort of 64 faculty members. Um, and of course, that was through our first integration of Hypothesis, but we also showed examples of that through uh, like comments in a Google Doc, for example. Um, just showing people that it's possible to have a, do a document that's more than just static reading and that it could be engaging and dynamic. Um, and just showing people that that is a possibility got them to integrate that technology into their own peer learning communities that they offered to faculty in their disciplines. And then many of those faculty having been exposed to it, then use that uh, technology in their classrooms in, in the fall. Um, so yeah, I could talk more about that later, but yeah, those are two examples. Um, and then I've also, speaking of the University of Minnesota, we recently um, started a pilot with Manifold. Um, so it's an open source publishing platform. Uh, from Minnesota, so it's uh, it has its own built-in annotation tools. Uh, so we're looking at using that for more digital scholarship projects, um, scholarly publishing kinds of things, and you could use that in a like a course group context where if there's a set of texts, you can create a course group and they could annotate that text within that platform. So it's not like an LMS integration or anything, but um, it's another kind of exciting example. Really interesting. Dana, Shauna, um, are there examples of, and I really appreciate Kyle also um, addressing that sort of exponential model that you had for publicizing. I like how it seemed like everything was working in powers of two, you know, so it's like eight people doing this and then 64 doing that. Were you purposely um, using that kind of like <laughs> binary exponential? I think we figured it like how, how small we wanted the resulting groups to be in the end um, and just kind of work back from there. But yeah, and I think from that program, I think we reached something like 90% of all the faculty that taught in the fall um, were exposed wow. to that program. Not all of them were exposed to social annotation, but they were sure. part of those peer learning communities. Right. Wow. That's amazing. Like exposing, I mean, exposing 90% of your faculty to anything seems pretty dramatic. Um, I see some nods from, from Dana and, and Shauna. Um, so what about Dana and Shauna? Do, do you get, is there, are there other social annotation tools that, at use in your schools? Um, uh, yes, I think Google Docs has definitely been um, a tool that some programs have used. I know that's been actively used. Um, we do have some using perusal and um, the man manifold is something that I don't actually know a whole lot about, but I know that's something out there. We have a couple people using a handful of other tools, um, but I think it's very, um, it's just very hit and miss. And so what I, I think what we've done with the hypothesis pilot is really work on pedagogy and really work on how do you use these tools well. And I, I the peer learning, Kyle, what you said about peer learning is really exciting to me. And I, I'm going to, that's something we've seen is faculty really want to connect with others who are doing this um, and get ideas and share um, surrounding hypothesis. But yeah, others who are using um, Google Docs, I think, would be the most common one that I see used. Yeah, and it does seem like, I mean, Google Docs is easy, right? Because if you can cut and paste something into a Google Doc, I mean, frankly, their social annotation in a Google Doc is pretty well done. It's pretty powerful. It can, can be a little too flexible sometimes, <laughs> but it, it does yeah. work pretty well. It's just, um, uh, the, it, it, I think the trade-off there and one of the very different um, models than the one Hypothesis uses is, and uh, Prusel uses the same model as Google Docs. It's like you have to bring the text to their tool in order to annotate it, whereas mm -hmm. Hypothesis sort of works the opposite way, right? Where you bring the annotation to the text wherever it happens to be living. So there's there's those two different models kind of going back to what are the differences between different tools um, that are in use like that? Um, uh, Dana, what about you? Do you have other, other social annotation? annotation tools going on at, at Santa Cruz? Yeah, I would echo the same thing as the previous two. Of course, we use Google Docs um, for collaborative work, especially. I personally haven't seen it used too much as a, as a social annotation tool. I just really, I'm not a plug, I promise. It just, there really doesn't seem to be a lot of a good substitute for hypothesis. The way that it integrates with our uh, LMS, with Canvas, and um, just the culture of hypothesis, for instance, I haven't used many other social annotations tool. For instance, I haven't heard of this. Um, uh, Digo. Digo, thank you. Um, I, but, I don't know if that's right. That's how I say it. <laughs> that that sounds right to me. That's how I'll say it. But okay. the, um, I know that 
when I have something, I have a question about hypothesis, I know the hypothesis team is going to email me back and work through the problem with me. I don't know about these other tools. Um, the fact that um, hypothesis is also free and open source um, is also an important factor for us using it, or at least for me personally using it. And the other thing I would say is um, I really appreciate how hypothesis also has a very public facing roadmap. Um, I asked them about, we, a, an instructor had asked about perusal because they were interested in video annotation. And I, I emailed Hypothesis of like, hey, is this on your roadmap? And, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but they did have a proof of concept. Am I allowed to? Okay. About DocDrop. And the proof of concept was fantastic. So it's uh, when maybe when it becomes more available, I don't know where it is in proof of concept versus like official drop, but um, Hypothesis is really receptive to um, additional features, um, other other ways to um, engage social annotation. That's not just how we've been using it, which is digital text. Oh yeah, thanks. So thank you so much for bringing that up, um, Nana, because uh, you know, in mentioning DocDrop, and then also the you know the support that you guys that you guys have all mentioned the support that you've worked with with hypothesis so thank you for that and there's quite a few of my hypothesis colleagues here in here in the crowd i noticed they've come to to bask in your praise i guess um but just to clarify a little bit on the cost thing right so like a lot of tools offer free web experiences right and hypothesis maintains a uh, uh, free and open what um, hosted version for in kind of individual use, although many institutions use it in an institutional way, but it's not fully supported for them when they do that, right? Just like any tool that you go grab for free off the web isn't really supported for you. And so institutions like Wake Forest and Santa Cruz and, and Minnesota College of Liberal Arts Designs is at, um, at the Twin Cities campus of the university are all using uh, hypothesis at a scale that they really want that full support kind of, you know, uh, relationship. And so that's that's the um, relationship between hypothesis and these schools. And money is changing hands, and that is the money that goes to pay for all the great support that y'all receive and the development of further features. And so that's that's sort of how it works. And so there's you know every software offering kind of solves the sustainability problem in a different way. Um, and so there's you know um, there's different models for that, and this just happens to be the one that hypothesis uses. Um, and to the note about DocDrop, um, I'm actually wondering if I'm looking at who is here in the crowd um, from Hypothesis, um, because we were just talking about DocDrop, which I put a link to in the, in the chat there. And DocDrop is our sort of, ex, it's a little bit of an experimental area that our CEO, Dan Whaley, kind of started to kind of try out some new things. It's like a little lab area. And what Dana is describing there is it has the ability you can drop in any YouTube URL and then you end up with an annotatable experience um, where the transcript of the video becomes an annotatable document, but linked to the video in a way that you can kind of work and see through both together. And we could even play around with it if we felt like it here. Um, but uh, the, we were just taught, the reason I'm dwelling on it um, ad infinitum is that we were just talking about it internally this morning, actually, and the degree to which it can also already um, play in the LMS integration. And so I don't have all the details on this, which is why I was hoping that somebody else from Hypothesis might be able to pop in and talk about it. But my understanding is that there is now the, the ability to use DocDrop hosted material in the LMS, which didn't used to be true. But one of the issues is, is that YouTube videos won't come through in that experience um, for a whole variety of actual security reasons. Um, so it doesn't, it, it won't pop in um, yet as a completely like, as the video editing, transcript editing experience that you get outside the LMS, but that is um, hopefully in the near future. So I don't know the full story, yet, <laughs> but it's like, you can feel it creeping towards something, and and that would be amazing because you know Hypothesis has long been primarily a textual focused annotation tool, and then uh, th granted this is still on the text of the transcript, but once you start to be able to interact with other kinds of um, you know content forms, I think it starts to become really powerful, and that kind of raises another question for me. Although I'm happy if if any of you wants to riff on any of that, maybe I'll chime in really quickly. Yeah, on, sure. Uh, 
so, like the, the conversation around the differences in the tools, you know, maybe Perusal has this feature or uh, maybe Digo or some other tool has, uh, you could annotate in a certain way. Um, one thing I've really appreciated about Hypothesis is all of the different conversations I'm able to have now with faculty, right? Um, so why is an open source tool preferable to um, other tools that are supported by advertising or whatever, or, or, or have really close integrations with, um, you know, corporate textbook publishers uh, where, you know, Hypothesis doesn't have that really formal relationship like that. And, and what does that mean? Um, so I'm, I'm able to have so many conversations with faculty about, um, about ed tech that are more philosophical in nature. And I think that they walk away from those conversations with a deeper appreciation for the choices that we've made at Wake Forest, um, like why we went with Hypothesis in the first place, as opposed to any other tool. Um, and are really valuing that um, we are taking those things seriously, right? Uh, you know, um, student privacy uh, and, um, and and things of that nature are in incredibly important and incredibly hard to um, get your to wrap your brain around these days. Um, and I think that uh, a relationship with uh, hypothesis is um, kind of a, a mark in the sand that we're on the side of students and that we are. are um, you know, thinking about those things more long term, and also things like um, I, I don't want to bash any um, uh, competitors or anything, but certain tools are organized more around the like transactional nature of education, where everything is built around a grade book, right? Um, and I could even criticize the LMS for that, but uh, other annotation tools have like really deep, rich grading capabilities. And what I've loved about Hypothesis is, I mean, there are really deep, rich grading capabilities built in with SpeedGrader, but in Canvas, but it's just as easy to leave an annotation assignment ungraded. And we've been having a lot of conversations on campus about the nature of grades and the kind of emerging ungrading uh, movement uh, as a result of the use of this tool. And so it's it's allowing us to have more pedagogical conversations too. So that's those are a couple of things that I've really appreciated. I have to weigh in on this, Kyle. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, we. You know, faculty come to us saying they need this particular functionality and I need that little thing that that tool does. And so when we can walk them back and look at what is it you're really trying to do, and then Hypothesis has been such a great example of exactly what you said, talking about student privacy and why that's important, talking about open source and why that's important, all the things you just said. Um, and I, you see eyes opening like, oh, there is more to what you all do than just make my life miserable, making me learn a new learning management system. Um, and the pedagogy conversations I've had around annot annotation, I don't know that I've had those around anything else, any other approach. And um, I'm really excited as we roll out of our pilot this year, um, I'm a little terrified for what's coming for me in August when we do this training, because I don't want people just using this because they think it looks cool or it looks great. Um, I want them using it well so students have a positive experience. And um, anyway, that sort of takes off in a different track. But yes, I agree. The conversations that we've been able to have around annotation have been wonderful and I really appreciate it. That's really cool stuff. Uh, I'm slowly moving the figures around, moving us back to Brady Bunch. Uh, maybe we'll just stay here for a while and see if there's some some talking heads. I'm really, I feel like our audience is a little quiet and I'm wondering um, wondering why nobody wants to come up on stage with us and uh, at least get me to shut up and talk to you guys um, with a different voice. Um, this this whole question, of I, I was really thinking a lot about uh, this topic that Kyle brought up around the different kinds of conversations that you guys have been having. And I, I don't think we should say thanks to Hypothesis because it seems like you guys have a really um, considered practice about how to have conversations with faculty about pedagogy already. And so it's like, can hardly, uh, can hardly blame it or credit it to Hypothesis. But um, uh, I'm, I'm curious the degree to which, uh, there's all, it seems to me that there's always a tension between tools and practice, right? And I feel like a lot of times in the ed tech world, there's this over-reliance on the idea that a tool, the adoption of a tool will generate either a set of practices or a set of results like student success 
that um, that that's why the tool should be adopted. And I, I like the idea of reversing that, right? Where we're focused more on the practices we want to enable and then which tools will best support those. And I wonder if that, I see some nodding heads. I'm wondering if that resonates with you guys at all and thinking about it in that reverse way. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll shut up for a second because I want to give Dana and Shanna a chance to chime in. Um, then yeah, I, I think hypothesis is just a really great introduction to a practice and it's one of the best tools for this practice of annotation. Um, and I, I don't know what, a better way to put that, right? It is a tool, but at its core, it is a practice. And until you're able to experience that firsthand, you, you, it, it's really tough to understand what social annotation actually is and why it's useful in your teaching. Um, so yeah, other tools do it, um, but I think those tools are tools first, practice second, um, because they come bundled with textbooks or something like that. Um, so anyway, I'll shut up now. <laughs> I see Dana unmuted, so. Yeah, uh, I'll second that. I'll say that um, all of our instructional designers at my campus are very more, f far more focused on um, finding a tool that works for you as opposed to making the tool work for you. Um, I think the experimenting is also good too. I We had a, a recent one change challenge that we asked our instructors to do and uh, it included a lot of things, but you know, one of those things might be trying out hypothesis, trying out Flickr, trying out this new tool. And I, I think it's okay if it doesn't work for you in your course. I think that's totally okay. Um, a lot of these tools are really dialectical. You know, you can have a relationship with it and come back. Um, but I think a lot of hypotheses is um, just trying it out and using it. And um, I, uh, all of the instructors that I've had worked with hypothesis so far have continued to use the tool each quarter that they're using. And I, I think the pandemic for all it has done for good and for bad, um, one of the things that we've seen is a lot of instructors want to continue using Canvas in the course, want to continue using these tools that they've had to use to, to make bridges and connections for their students. And I think Hypothesis is going to be on that list as well. Even if they've returned to in-person, there's just something about annotating a text socially, uh, digitally, and making reading visible um, that I think instructors are going to want to continue to do with their students. Yeah, I totally agree. One of the things that came out, this happened pretty early in the pandemic, was a couple of faculty came to me and talked about how surprised they were to see some students that, you know, they were physically in class for a few months and then they went online. And the differences in how students behaved, the ones who were physically in class and then once they were online, and that some of the students who were very quiet in class were actually quite eloquent in the asynchronous spaces. And so that's one of the pieces we really want to carry forward. And when I ask faculty if they want to use, and this is not to diss on any other tool, but do they want to use the Canvas discussion or do they, the ones who have used the Canvas discussion and the and hypothesis, they look at me like, and they don't even think that they're even the same. And so they all go for reading, you know, the hypothesis because it takes students so much closer to the content and to the reading. Um, and I, I'm hoping they're all going to keep using it even in an in-person space, because it does allow that asynchronous um, reflection that's very different for students. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering about that. The future is, you know, what what are the fall plans at your institutions? Are are you all headed back? Like, Sean, are you, all, are you headed back to more face-to-face -face environment um, at Twin Cities? Yes, it's, what did I hear? 80% um, in person, there are, I think I heard we had 120 courses out of 2000 or something that will be remote or online. So it's a very small percentage. Um, there's a whole lot of other conversation we could have about that, but <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> yeah, it's mostly in person. Um, but I do think all of the faculty that I know that used hypothesis in this last year, have been, they've been emailing me, do you know anything yet about next year? Do you know anything? And so they're, they're very anxious to keep, keep moving ahead. How about how about uh, at Santa Cruz, Dana? Are you guys you're headed back? I know you spoke about it a little bit, but you're headed back to more face to face, right? Yeah, we're headed back to more face to face in fall, but we'll still have some um, mixed modalities as well, and um, some sessions will still be remote, uh, much to the chagrin of some instructors. So, 
You sound like you're a little sad about going back to face to face. <laughs> um, I'm not. It's it's definitely mixed feelings. Um, I think again, the pandemic has done a lot of bad, but also a lot of good. Uh, again, it's interesting to hear the the comments from instructors about what they want to keep um, since they've had to use a lot of these technologies, um, like Canvas. Um, so it's it's going to be an interesting fall, to say the least. Yeah, it's, I, I think of nothing else. The pandemic has it's it's highlighted so many things. It's brought so many things, you know, emphasized many things that are good and many, many, many things that are bad also. And it's just given us a chance to, I think, be more intentional maybe about how we think about some things. I, I know we had to do it in a bit of a rush, but like just the idea of remote delivery, like everybody has had to sort of grapple with it maybe in a way that a lot of folks didn't have to before. And you guys have, of course, been on the front lines of that. So I should shut up now. What about what about at Wake Forest, Kyle? Are you guys you're headed back tomorrow face to face too? Yeah, it's, I, you know, knock on wood, but I think um, they're hoping to have fall be as quote unquote normal as possible. Um, and in a normal semester, we would have very very few um, online or even blended courses at all. Um, and I, I don't think they're going to revoke faculty preference uh, if they want to teach fully online. I don't think they're going to um, disallow that. But I think departments are really pushing heavy for. Um, pushing hard for as much face-to-face -face as possible. So, yeah, it'll be different for sure. Um, and I'm I'm anxious to see what that's going to do to our hypothesis usage once we're back. And, you know, like I said earlier, we're very small classes. And, you know, that seminar-style discussion is one of those things that hypothesis allows you to do in an online course. Um, but when we're back in a seminar room, right, are yeah. they going to continue doing it? Well, interesting thing came up in, I think it was yesterday's, featured educator office hours. And I think, Shauna, you were there too. So maybe you remember, but we were talking about um, the degree to which uh, students pre-reading and pre-discussing an hypothesis before the synchronous sessions that might be face-to-face, -face, right, was actually um, doing it, a couple of different things. One was making the discussion that finally happened when it was synchronous better. Um, both enabling the teacher to focus on some things that had come out in the discussion, but also meaning the students had sort of gotten some of the preliminaries out of the way maybe, and were ready to dive in on, on some particular parts more deeply. And then the other th part that was new to me and interesting was talking about how um, uh, social annotation was also making grading take less time, uh, which I thought was a really, I'd be interested to hear your guys' take on that because um, the instructor was saying that um, she felt like because students were um, sort of more engaged in the reading because of the social annotation assignments, it improved their overall kind of um, success in all the assignments, like in the writing assignments. And so she felt like she spent less time grading the assignments because she wasn't focused in on some of the basics more. And it was more like they were grappling with the real ideas that she wanted to grapple them with and so i'm my fingers are crossed that we can bridge this gap to face to face and go back to that more without like losing the powers that we discovered when we were remote i guess that was more of a statement than a question wasn't it <laughs> go ahead because um, i'd love to talk about student student and student perspectives and there's a, a question in here about students suggesting hypothesis um and i think I haven't seen that, but I we did a, we did some I did evaluation. So I did survey. We got a hundred, uh, almost two hundred student responses, and um, then focus groups with faculty. And the interesting piece about what that was, the faculty saw much more of an impact of hypothesis on things like discussion and papers, and that the students weren't quite as enthusiastic. But I don't. You know, we'd ask them, did you read closer? And they're like, nah, we did it the same. And then I would ask faculty the same thing. And they're like, oh, yeah, they were reading closer. <laughs> so I just thought that was a fascinating disconnect between what the students thought the impact was and what faculty were saying. So, um, anyway, yes. Different points of view. <laughs> and so, and, and Dana, I interrupted. You were going to. Oh, no, by all means. No, that's an interesting point because we haven't, we don't have a lot of student feedback on the tool yet, um, more general comments, but it is interesting talking to the instructors' reactions from what they think they're interpreting from their students. And I don't know about making grading easier, although it doesn't surprise me. It's very interesting. But from one of our strongest users of Hypothesis, he said that it's been more interesting for him to see how their annotations change throughout the quarter. 
his, our quarter is 10 weeks and he had a reading assigned every week. So from week one, how their annotations changed compared to week nine and week 10 has been really transformative in his uh, methods of teaching as well, so. I heard that too, same thing. The, the student results have been fascinating to me to see where they, um, the things they liked the best, and I should have pulled them up before I came. The things they liked the best were knowing what other students thought. And I, I there's real value in that, that I think they, oh, someone else has that question, so I don't feel so stupid asking it. You know, where they would, you know, they would say, hey, I know the answer to that, so they would jump in. It felt, I think it was very empowering for students. At least that's what I'm reading in the data. That was the number one thing, and that they were able to reference their notes during discussion, but that knowing what other students thought during the readings was the biggest, that was the biggest takeaway that students gave us. Yeah, and I, I think we we hear that from other folks too, like, um, I don't know if you remember back to um, I Annotate 2019, vintage I Annotate, um, <laughs> before, the, before the pandemic, um, when uh, Juan Pablo Alperin uh, gave a kind of uh, a talk and I could find a recording for folks who are interested about some early um, sort of quantitative quantitative and qualitative data that they'd collected at his institution about student student perceptions of, of what social annotation ended up doing for them. Um, and a lot of them did focus in on that um, that uh, you know being able to see others read alongside um, them as, as being a power. Um, and uh, I think one thing that has come up in some of these other office hours is this idea about how social annotation can kind of, in a way, lower the stakes of reading at the same time as making it more intentional because it like it enables people to say things in the margins like, I didn't quite understand this or something. And as soon as you feel free, as if you can feel free to exhibit that wonder and curiosity openly with your classmates, then that can unpack a whole flood of other possibilities of peer learning and you know different kinds of discussions that could fold out from that. And so I do you guys all have plans to do um, sort of student data gathering or are already underway with some of that? I don't know, Kyle, you may have done some of that at Wake Forest, right? Yeah, we um, had a fall 2020 survey for both faculty and students. And by the time we did it, everyone was so surveyed out that we wanted to make them really concise. Um, so I think we asked um, like some general usage information about hypothesis um, on both surveys. It didn't shed a lot of light on um, like what they felt, thought about it or you know what their attitudes or how it helped their learning. Um, so it was me trying to like elbow my way into a survey, <laughs> but it didn't really yield a lot of really useful results. Um, I would love to know more about you know what they think of the tool just kind of anecdotally what i've heard from faculty is i'll just echo what everyone else has said that you know it, it improves student discussions and, and it improves their reading um and I, i've even heard from a few students who i've spoken with anecdotally or you know my own students in the course that i teach um you know do you prefer this over something like a canvas discussion and they're like oh yeah this is so much better um, yeah so that makes sense Dana, are you guys doing student? I know that Hypothesis itself offers a, a student and faculty survey that I, you probably may have all participated in, and I can't remember exactly. Um, but are you have you guys surfaced any student reactions to using the tool, Dana? We haven't yet, and I don't know if we have plans currently for doing that. We did have the Hypothesis survey that um, Aaron helped coordinate. Um, that was interesting, but it was really more anecdotal evidence. Um, I. I wish we had more. It'd be great to see. Um, mostly my view is is from the dashboards um, from Hypothesis, which are also very fantastic and helpful to see. But of course, that's just the analytics of, of student interaction and student use. So it's helpful to have the students' opinions. Um, I'd be interested to know. Yeah. I, I echo the um, admiration for the dashboards. It's been really um, for a lot of for the couple of faculty who I've gotten to use them, it's been a game changer. It's really made a big difference. Um, I do, we, we did, uh, my previous position, I did program evaluation all the time. So it's just a knee jerk reaction for me to do evaluation. So we did do the student surveys and the focus groups. And 
I think it was very instrumental in getting adoption. Um, we're hoping, yeah, in getting adoption because we had that student voice and that student input on it. Um, I hope we can continue it. I've been working with um, Dr. Bodong Chen, who spoke, led the research panel yesterday, um, and I'm hoping we can continue doing some of that research. Um, and would love to coordinate, Nate, with hypothesis on the surveys that go out this semester um, that we could, so we're not double asking, it would be great to coordinate. Yeah, I know we've, we've had some tension over that. And thank <laughs> you for your, thank you for your goodwill with that. Um, oh, no tension, just let's coordinate. Yeah. So we get, you know, we, uh, and um, we have found too, that we do the surveys. And then if I, uh, we did focus groups with faculty as a way to get some deeper dive qual qualitative data. And I would like to be able to do that with students. If I just put a call out to students, even if we get you know, eight or 10 students on a focus group, that's yeah. really good input, so. It's, it's always hard to get students to do anything when they're so busy. Um, I know faculty Ooh. is also hard, but um, yeah. yeah they, well, that's the thing. We had so many faculty willing to do the focus groups, we had to turn some people away. Whoa. So that tells me something. Yeah, <laughs> we did, I think we offered three focus groups and we kept them small on Zoom, but we did end up with, I think almost, we. I think we ended up with 14 faculty who did the focus groups, which, which I was really surprised at. Yeah, especially um, in this time when we've all had too many Zoom yeah. meetings, right? And and the, they were so, and it sounds kind of like you've experienced this too, that the, they were so excited to talk to each other about how they used it and they learned so much from each other. Um, and I asked them point blank, I said, do you want us to do like a community of practice around this? And they all agreed, so we'll see. I really like that idea, especially since, you know, my job as instructional technology specialist is like, oh, look at all these fun tools you can use in your course. But I think sometimes it comes off as a little like, um, I'm just trying to get you to use tools because that's my job is how to work these tools. I, it's interesting to get faculty buy-in because I think faculty talk to each other and sometimes they're a lot more convinced if a faculty, another faculty member has had such a great experience that they want to start using it too. So focus groups is a good idea. Yeah, the, and it, it, the focus groups, we did have questions, but kind of I would ask a question and we would shut up and sit, sit back and let them talk to each other. Um, and that's how the word of, it's all been word of mouth. They brought it up with other people. And then um, for the training I'm gonna do in August, I'm going to use faculty more than me. Um, I'll also be reaching out to Becky, um, but I'm definitely gonna pull in faculty to do that. That's all great stuff, and I uh, I should learn from your practice and just shut up more and let you guys do the talking. Um, one thing that I wanted, I, you guys mentioned the dashboards, and um, we, we probably really can't show one off here because of student privacy issues, but um, uh, just so folks in the audience may not know, um, one of the primary folks behind the dashboards, John Udell, um, one of my colleagues I think is here in the, in the crowd, um, and so big kudos to John for having moved through that work a little bit. Um, and we'll get to a question from Curtis in just a second. But I also wanted to um, post in the chat a link to um, uh, a study that's going on at Indiana University that is really going to try to dive deeply, both quantitatively and qualitatively. It's a multi-year study into the connections between student reading and writing and success and social annotation. And so, um, uh, that that's a really powerful set of data that's just finished its first term of collection now and will, it will continue over the next couple of years. And so we'll start to be seeing some, I think, scholarly output from that, um, maybe even informally starting this summer and then, and then moving on. Um, but going back to those dashboards for a minute, um, the reason that they're not that not everybody has experienced them is, again, sort of like with a doc drop thing, we kind of developed them in a little bit of a laboratory environment and have been working with folks like these folks here to kind of um, figure out what, what kind of data is gonna be most useful both to you who are stewarding institutional usage of a tool, but then also you know at the instructor level and even at the student level. And so we've been drawing some really good lessons from that and um, I think have really gotten to a place where we've, um, We've been able to produce a lot of really, a lot of data, 
maybe too much in some cases, but in, but in other cases, some really interesting, um, I think, insights have maybe come out of that. We've been noticing some things like connections between, in certain classes, there might be a high number of threaded annotations in the sense that there's a root annotation and then a conversation that happens on, uh, you know, out of that root annotation. And in other classes, it's the opposite. It's just a series of kind of standalone ins uh, annotations without much conversation attached to them. And we don't know maybe why yet, but there's these already these interesting patterns of usage arising in different disciplines and, and contexts. And I think there's, there's a really great future in, um, in exploring that. And with the caveat that I think Ramey and, and, and Taro were guiding us toward in their keynote this morning of whose data is it and not not trying to turn it into a surveillance of reading on students, but instead turning it into like, what can we learn as educators from the practices that already exist and what can we do to make them better? And so I'm, I'm kind of curious if you guys have interacted with the data that's come out of the dashboards in any in any sort of um, kind of deliberate way yet, or is it still just exploration? Go ahead, Kyle. We haven't really. Okay. Yeah. For us, it's, it's fairly more, new. Yeah, for us, it's just been mostly um, satisfying some curiosity and just poking around a little bit. It's really neat to see those numbers, um, but we don't quite know what questions to ask of it yet. I think. I would yeah. agree. It's been very exploratory for us as well. I will say that the surprise, confusion, or lack of understanding—I don't know if that was the right phrase—but um, though that that has been the most interesting one for me to see. Yeah, and it's, I think it's, um, maybe John could pop up here and explain a little better, but I believe that it's a pretty simplistic uh, mm. uh, thing that just looks for annotations that, you know, have certain kind of keywords and stuff in them that might express surprise, lack of understanding, confusion, whatever. Um, and so it just tries to surface that in, a, in uh, maybe a simplistic way, but it's already interesting, right? And we can do, I mean, there's kind of a whole digital humanities possibility standing behind this, right? Because now we have... Uh, a whole set of data about people interacting with text that we didn't really have before. And I think that could really lead to some interesting things. Um, seeing who else is. Uh, so yeah, John, so in, just to finalize this kind of conversation on the dashboards maybe, um, so uh, institutions that are um, working with Hypothesis formally and pilots or subscription have access to these um, dashboard environments. And so, um, and I'm trying to remember Fresno State's um, relationship. I'm sorry, I, I typically have these things memorized, but I, I'm not sure what what stage you guys are at with us. But if you could reach out to your other, um, or I'll I'll follow up on the back end too and reach out to your uh, the co my colleagues who are interacting directly with Fresno State. But the basic idea is that, um, and uh, and this is for institutions that are using Hypothesis integrated into their LMS. Um, there's a way to kind of surface an externalized dashboard of data that can be read. And so um, depending on how what your relationship with hypothesis is and how far along it is, we can help hook you up with that. Um, and then something else that comes with a supported pilot and subscription environment with hypothesis. Um, I did notice that there uh, is uh, John has raised his hand, which could be really cool. So we could bring him up on stage to talk more about the dashboards. And then um, Maybe while we're doing that, I'm going to throw um, Curtis's question up on the stage, and you guys can address that while John is joining. How about that? Yeah, I've been thinking about Curtis's question here, um, and maybe I'll just dive in. So as I said earlier, my team also handles um, copyright questions uh, for faculty. Um, we you know, kind of liaise between our um, course reserves department um, and help faculty better understand what they're able to do with texts um, in online environments. Um, and this is another one of those areas where Hypothesis has opened up opportunities for a conversation. Um, and I'm not a lawyer, so none of this is legal advice, but kind of where we've settled on this question is that if there's no other way to access a text um, and the pedagogy relies on social annotation, the use of Hypothesis, and the only way to get that text is through like a, an OCR PDF, then yes, we're going with a fair use argument for that. Um, and, you know, it's um, not neat and tidy, but I think empowering faculty to teach in the way that they need to teach without feeling like they're constrained by copyright concerns um, is really important. 
now if this were happening in an open environment um, outside of the LMS, we'd probably have a, a different attitude about it. Um, and of course, we're telling faculty like, you know, don't go wild and scan your entire textbook. Um, let's have a conversation about that. And like, maybe you can scan a couple of pages that are really central to the text and have your students annotate that. Um, but yeah, going with that four factor fair use analysis. And if you're not familiar with that, you can Google a four factor analysis. Um, the, the, the quantity of the text, I think is the, the most important part here. Um, if they're reading a short article, then they need to read the whole article and annotate that. Um, but if you're scanning entire chapters of uh, textbooks, then that's going to kind of jeopardize the, the market for the book. So um, yeah, it's, as with all things fair use, it's a case by case basis, but we want to empower faculty. And it's a balance, right? Um, hey, welcome, John Udell. You're here. I am. And, and we can hear you. Excellent. Um, so I just wanted to mention a couple of things real quick. First sure. of all, we don't know what questions need to be asked and answered either. <clears throat> so what you see on the dashboard right now is essentially uh, what everyone's asked for so far. Um, but we've uh, had relatively little feedback uh, at this point, um, mostly from uh, administrators and especially uh, not enough from teachers. So uh, and, and I think that the questions that we need to be asking are ultimately going to be coming from teachers. So, you know, kind of looking forward to, to more feedback. The, the, the stuff that you see on the dashboards is kind of the tip of the iceberg and the real work that's gone into this is making it quick and easy to ask and answer, you know, new questions. So, you know, bring them on and, um, and we will continue to iterate on this stuff. John, that's exciting. I have a couple faculty who I know would be um, very, would love to talk to you at some point about what they want. If I put this idea in their head, I'll ask them what they want. Um, would love to connect with you on that. Great, thanks. And thanks for thanks for coming up, John. Um, it's weird. I, for some reason, I seem to have lost my ability to move us back to the Brady Bunch view. I don't know what the problem is. Um, maybe it's because we're out of time. But I did notice that it is the top of the hour, um, and so maybe uh, maybe we should bring it to a close there. Even though I'm sure everybody. Uh, could talk all day if we wanted to about this really cool stuff. But I really want to thank Kyle, Dana, and Shana for, for coming today. You, you guys were just awesome. It was a really great conversation. I enjoyed it immensely. And I think that our uh, our folks did too. We did record it, so we can also share it um, in an ongoing way, as long as you guys are OK with that. <laughs> um, and uh, 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 there's, I want to just point out that there are um, a couple of other things happening here um, both today and tomorrow at the conference that might be of interest to folks, including sessions on world languages and STEM with social annotation. Um, and then in about uh, minus two minutes, Jeremy is going to be giving a kind of update on the hypothesis of roadmap. So I'm thinking we should adjourn. I will say goodbye and thank you and people can go attend these other events if they so wish. Thanks so much. Thank you.